This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geek, show number 588 with guest Gavin Campbell. Recorded on October 19th, 2023. Here on Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into news reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the Average Tech Guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the Average Guy Tech Team Studios here in a beautiful Bellevue, Nebraska. Fall is here, and we're loving every minute of it. Of course, we post a show with some world-class show notes out at the Average Guy. There'll be a few tonight out at the Average Guy. Big thanks to Dave McCabe, who joined me last week. We'll refer back to Dave a few times, maybe, tonight. And uh, Dave, thanks for coming on. Always great to be with him. I get a lot of comments when I interview dave on the show a lot of you guys remember him from home server show and uh he's just one of my best friends to hang out with so dave thanks for coming in here big thanks to our patreon subscribers as well if you're one of those uh thank you thanks for doing that appreciate it if you're not and you want to join the team head out to the average guy.tv slash patreon i've got a five dollar plan uh, i just got a new patron p- patron i guess is what we're calling those um these days randall black joined me out there and so Randall, thanks for jumping in there. Appreciate you doing that. If you want to do it and give it a try, you can do it for one month or as long as you want. Uh, the average guy.tv slash Patreon. I said it before and I messed up his name. I don't know why, but Gavin Campbell is joining. I, it said, because in the notes, it said Dave McCabe, and then I blah, fell all over it. Gavin, welcome. Uh, welcome back. It's always great to have you. You've been making the circuit these days. What other podcasts have you been on? I heard you on another one what do you what have you been doing these, these so days? we have our own podcast hometech.fm so i do that with tj and seth but uh this week i will i will be on i don't think it's posted yet but entertainment 2.0 um i've been uh, you know i've been on that a couple times now where, with yeah. richard gunther so yeah. you know you like, and then of, of course home gadget geeks this is you know it seems like a quarterly thing now I'm yeah you know i love i love having you on here you bring great content you get you're kind of be come you have kind of we're both kind of tired so this is there may be a lot of uh, stumbling on words tonight uh you have kind of become our home automation expert dave admitted uh on the show last week that he had tried out home assistant yes didn't know didn't know what to do with it (laughs) once he got it up and running didn't know what to do with it my home assistant uh instance is running well you know, I think I've like I got all my my Govi sensors for the humidor for the cigars. Those are all on there. Got all the ring, um, you know, kind of all the the ring th- stuff on there. Got all my switches, all my lights, all the the uh, batteries for the ring, all the like the um, the uh, ink ink uh volumes whatever you call that how much ink is left in my printer oh yeah like i have an hp printer kind of thing in there crazy i got my 21 my 2021 legacy uh all the the mileage and the odometer you know so the odometer reading and all the tire pressure and stuff sitting on the i don't that's probably not the best use for it but it's there right and the weather as well the shield stuff comes in so there's a lot i mean there's a lot of things available for that right yeah, Home Assistant, if anything, what it's got going for it is it integrates with everything pretty much, like almost too much. And uh, that's also kind of one of the downfalls of it. And we're seeing this even recently with Mazda. They actually, uh, there was an integration with Mazda's online service, and they recently uh, sent them a cease and desist or whatever you would call that, right? To say, hey, we didn't authorize this. You're not allowed to use it. Please remove uh, it, right? Uh, and okay. I can see where Mazda is going because with Home Assistant, a lot of these integrations, like I think the ring integration is using, you know, kind of like reverse engineered uh, APIs, you know, MyQ Uh integration, same type of thing, right? So you got to always keep that in mind that any day something can break because they're not official integrations. And I just hope that Mazda didn't set up uh, like uh, precedence for other companies to do the same thing, right? Because then that would just ruin, you know, the Home Assistant and what I like so much about it. Do you think it's pulling too much data uh, or, or like what would be the incentive for them for to take a customer who's using it? It's their customer and say, no, I'm sorry. We're going to take the functionality away from you. What, what's the reason for that? You mean somebody like Mazda? Like Mazda. Yeah. yeah, that doesn't seem like great customer service. 
Not really, but like Mazda has to pay for the servers. They have to host the servers and then you have home assistant coming in and, you know, they're letting people get the information and use their, their service. And Mazda doesn't get anything of that. You know, when you think of yeah, something uh, like, yeah. when you yeah. think of like my Q, for example, like I know this because I, I, I wrote my own driver for that one at the time. This is the only way we could do it, but to get this, the, the door state, you actually had to ping the server to get it. So you constantly had a loop to ping it almost every three seconds. Now, if you have a lot of people doing that, it hammers the server. Mm -hmm. They're going to try and stop it. Yeah. Well, I hope Subaru doesn't, doesn't uh, take it away from it. Listen, it's, it's, you know, odometer range, like how much gas do I have left? The average, my fuel, you know, my fuel consumption average and the tire pressures uh, across the four tires. Uh, and oh, I didn't notice this. It's, it tells me if the doors are locked or not. I didn't, I never, that's cool. I never saw that is cool. That's actually helpful. I can kind of look and say, Hey, is that thing, is it, is it locked before I go to bed? Um, you, you put in the show notes, uh, year of the voice on this. I don't use voice with it. Tell me like, am I, you always tell me I'm missing something when I'm on the show. Am I missing (laughs) something? Do you use voice at all? Like any, not with uh, home assistant. I mean, I use it. Yeah. The, 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 that, that device is sitting right here and I have a, I have a Google one as well, but, uh, but can I, can I do it on this? Of course. Yeah. Of yeah. course, you can integrate it. You expose your um your your devices to those services, oh, and then now okay. you can just control them. And you can ask questions like, "Is the back door open?" or "Is my car unlocked?" or something like that. And like, like uh, one we use a lot is, "What's the temperature in the pool?" And she'll tell us, right? So it's great. Um, but what Home Assistant's doing right now is they're building. They've been building this year their own voice assistant. So they kind of said, we don't want to log your information. We don't like the companies that do that. We're building a home assistant that runs locally to you and you have full Mm. control over. And it's been an amazing year because they announced that kind of like the end of last year and said 2023, the year of the voice. And then we've been watching the progression of them developing this throughout the year. Um, Whether they started with like doing text to speech and speech to text, right? And then you could only control it via text at one point. And just recently, well, last time, then they introduced voice control, right? But it was like you had to press a button and then you could say something. But last week or so, they introduced wake words, right? And that was kind of like one of the last missing pieces. So now you can say, you can make your own wake word, right? One of the ones that ship with it is Jarvis, which is what I'm dying for. I was dying to get a Jarvis in my house, you know, mm-hmm. from Iron Man. Mm-hmm. And they actually have it now. So you can say, hey, Jarvis, and then it will kick on and Mm. do whatever you want. Right. Um, so it's not totally finished yet. They're, they're still looking to take it further, but it's like all the foundations there and they're now developing it a lot along further doing things like tying it into chat GPT. So, you know, if it's beyond basic control, they'll pass it off to chat GPT and that will answer your other questions. So Mm. it's going to be something to really keep an eye on. Do I have to join like a beta program? Is it available to me through a regular integration? Do I have to, I'm assuming I have to have some special hardware to make it work. Like, you know, I'm using the surface, uh, surface pro as kind of the dashboard for this. Yep. Is that something I can, I know like when I installed the Bluetooth sensor, that's got to go on the computer. That's actually running home assistant. Do I have to, I don't have to run a microphone to that computer. Do I, can I run it from my surface? How's that working? Um, it, it's, it's very like to use it, the assist is actually built into home assistant. So we can get you set up. It's, there's no beta program. It's released for everybody. So we can okay. get you set up and you can type to it. Right. But to get the voice um, part, and this is very fresh. I've been playing, I, I'm trying to play with it. You will actually need some hardware. So they give you examples of like a raspberry Pi four with this microphone, or they have this one little device called M five stack. That's really cool. It's just a little square and it has a microphone and stuff built in. Um, but they call those voice satellites, right? And those are what you're going to have to get for now. Like I said, this is all like being unraveling now as we speak. So this is what they're testing and playing on. They're not saying this will be something, you know, they'll recommend later on. There could be other hardware. Right. So, yeah, you will have to get a little dirty and stuff like that, but it's really cool how it works. It's all local. Um, And then 
like if you want to get into the weeds with it, how it works is basically all these little satellite, um, uh, what they call home voice satellites. They actually just sit there and they stream your audio to your home assistant, right? Mm -hmm. And your home assistant actually does all the wake word detection and all the processing and everything. So these little satellites don't even have to actually have any power on them. Like they could be very low power devices. Um, and all they have to do is stream uh, audio. Okay. It's really cool to okay. watch. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look into it. I, I mean, I've got, it's running. I mean, it's a touch screen computer that has a microphone and a camera yeah. on it. I, I would think at some point, maybe that, that, that could be one of those satellites. Right. And it, yes. it would push it's way underpowered. I mean, it barrel, to be honest with you, it's so old, it barely runs the dashboard. Uh, as it is, it, it's good enough, right? All I needed to do is when I touch it, turn it off, turn it off, those kinds of things. Um, a lot of what I look at is just a sensor. I just want to see where things are at. Like what's the humidity of my cigars or what's, are these lights turned on or off? Some of those kinds of things. So be helpful if I could use the microphone on that and get the, the you know, get it to do it. How are you using that or are you thinking of using that any differently than you would a digital assistant if you had both would you choose one over the other for various tasks or what's the advantage it, it all depends like in the end it all comes down to the function like how well does it work yeah. right and yeah. they have some demo videos of people that have already done some really cool things i was there was one guy with a droid um, I think it was from Mandalorian or something, and he would call it by name, and it would beep, 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 and, you know, the head would spin, and it would answer, yeah. and then he would give it a command, and it would go and process it. It's really cool what people are doing, um, but it comes down to how well will it work, and it, the other thing it comes down to is those other questions, not just home control. But like the wife would ask, you know, what's the weather like today in Pickering or, you know, what's her drive like today? Because, you know, with the Amazon, it will tell us, you know, if she has any traffic or how long her drive's going right. to be and stuff right. like that. So if I take those away, she will get mad. That will cause an argument. <laughs> right? So I got to make sure, you know, um, if I bring this in, it's got to be like for like in terms of features um, yeah. because she's yeah. used to certain things and change isn't a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's something I got to remember to do. I, I go in spurts where I'll check the drive, you know, to work. Yeah. And I almost never check it on the way home. I don't care. I'm leaving work. Doesn't matter how long it's going to take. And I wonder if that's just, if that's a function of, like, I take a back way home now. Like, I don't take the interstate anymore to get home. I kind of take these back roads. Maybe it takes me five minutes, maybe 10 minutes longer, but it's so much less stress, stress. right? Yeah. It's, it's, I actually enjoy my commute again, kind of deal, but I don't, I don't, because I do that, I don't, um, I don't check the traffic as often. And that's, that's kind of a habit you got to get into, right. Of like, Hey, tell me, tell me how my commute is. And I, I guess maybe in some bigger cities where Bay area, LA, New York, like whatever here in the United States, maybe that has more of a more of a function for some than it does for others. I just have a hard time remembering to ask. I should. It doesn't cost me anything, right? Exactly. Well, she asks every morning, you know, just while she's getting ready. And yeah. I realize because there are some certain mornings where that one accident along the route will just make mm -hmm. you late for work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most of the time it's the same 20 minute drive for her to work. Yeah. But when it yeah. says 45 minutes, now you're like, wait, what, what, what's up here? <laughs> so Yeah. Good. I guess I'd want that. For me, it need to be proactive to like, hey, I'm in my car. <laughs> it's this time of the morning. Chances are I'm probably going to work. And it could probably just proactively say to me, Hey, I see you're going to work. Do you want the do you want the traffic? I'd prefer that to having to remember to ask it. You know, you could get home assistant to do it for you. It has a Waze integration. I use that. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. It does. It oh. has a Waze integration so you can put your work in your home and it will always calculate, you know, the current time and you can use that somehow in some automation. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'll give you a yeah. project for next week. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll be working on those two, on those two voice things. You'd also mentioned some, in a, is this MM wave sensors that, uh, that, that you're using? I, you know, sensors around the house have always seemed a little creepy. Uh, but but t uh, tell me a little bit why why has this become your favorite? 
This is one of my sleeper favorites. Um, it'll be my pick for probably favorite tech or product this year, you know, on our year end show, right? But um, wh when it comes to sensors, you're usually used to the PIR sensors, you know, when you walk into a room, you can, it'll say, hey, somebody's here and flick on, or when it detects motion, right? You can have it flick on a light. Well, millimeter wave sensors work a little differently. And I, I can't explain the technology, you know, has to do with microwaves or radio waves and bouncing off things. But the cool thing about it is that it can detect people in a room, even if they're not moving. So even something just you breathing, it will detect you sitting there. So you won't run into that, you know, you're sitting on the couch watching TV and your lights turn off because it thinks no one's there anymore. This knows, always knows you're there. Hmm. Right. And it's pretty amazing how it works. Um, the one company is Akara. They have a FP2 sensor. And this is probably my pick for favorite device because this sensor is pretty amazing with what it can do. It can track like up to five people in the room. Right. Um, and not just that, but where in the room they are. Right. And that's the cool part because you can have it do things like if you sit in your favorite chair in your living room turn on my lamp for me automatically. And then as soon as I get up from that chair, you can have it turn off the lamp, right? And the technology behind this is pretty amazing for a device that probably costs like $100, right? So I, I have this set up in my family room and there's certain automations and things we have it doing based on the couch or the chair, you know, or if somebody's sitting in both, it will track up to five people. Um, or even in my office, when I sit down on my computer, it turns on, you know, the office light, for example. So. Does it know who the person is? No, it just puts you... So no profile? No, no. Okay. It just okay. puts dots on a screen. So you basically, okay. in their app, you draw out the room, right? And then you could put a chair here, a couch there, the TV here, and you can say the walls and what's out of balance and stuff. And from there, it does all its calculations. Huh. Huh. On the Amazon site, and I'll throw the link uh, to both the, the TI site and Amazon where you, you can pick up this uh, Acora. Um, sensor this fp2 they say fall detection right yes. and it's part of the in in and so i'm imagining because it can sense people moving not moving is it watching for that kind of or can it watch for that kind of body movement that says i was upright now i'm no longer upright now listen every morning i walk out of my <laughs> bedroom and i we, i lay on the couch in the, in, you know, to, to kind of wake up, I know I'm supposed to be awake doing things, but I have, a, you know, I go out to the couch. Well, I think I have fallen down if I'm, if I just go out and lay down on the couch, or I guess maybe because I tell it, I don't know. How's that? No, work? it's a, it's a little smarter than that. So for, um, regular detection, right? Like you can only use it in one mode or the other really. Right. So in regular detection, you know, for room presence, uh, they, they want you to mount it on the wall, right. At a certain height, optimum, uh, you know, they have, they have, things to follow as to where you should put this now for fall detection though they want you to mount it on the ceiling right and that's because uh, it monitors differently and i think okay. it's monitoring how fast you may be going down and then saying oh they may have tripped at that point because they went yeah. down that fast so unless yeah. you're you know diving into your couch you know i don't think you're gonna trip it <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I kind of fall fast. Yeah, in the morning. and when you mount it that high, you actually lose range in terms of occupancy detection in the okay. room too. So okay. it's kind of a one or the other. But if you ever wanted to put both in the room, and you, you could put two in a room, one does mm. fall detection, one does the presence detection, and you go from there. Right now, a twelve dollar coupon for the U.S. store, so eighty two ninety nine takes it down to seventy. Uh, which is not which is not terrible. Do you think you would set it up in a situation maybe where you're like, you have a lamp near a chair. When someone sits in that chair, automatically turn on the lamp. Stuff like yeah. stuff like that. Is that? Yeah, some people do that. Other examples I've seen is people as they uh, go through their kitchen in their living room or something like that. So they go into their kitchen, it will detect them at their sink and turn on the lights around the sink. Um, and when they go to the kitchen table, it detects people at the kitchen table, it will turn on the lights there. As soon as everyone gets up and leaves, it'll turn off the lights at the kitchen table after a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Like we're getting into like true auto automation of like zones in your house. And I have to give another shout out to the everything one sensor. So that's that's another sensor that, uh, you know, like um, a home assistant, you know, um, fan, I guess. He made his own sensor called the Everything One, and he just released the Everything One light. 
Um, it's a similar technology with millimeter wave, but his everything one sensor also has the PIR sensor. So basically it uses the PIR to sense the initial motion and then it uses the millimeter wave to continue. So it's faster, it acts faster. Wow. It doesn't do person detection like how the FP2 does, but I know he's been playing around with it and working on it and he'll release an update if he gets it working how he likes it, right? So that's just another one to give a little shout out to because that's a very popular one as well. Is that everything smart? Dot io is that the uh, is that the site so or every, everything presents one this looks I, like yeah everything smart dot io yes yep yep so okay, he's a youtuber I'll, lewis yep i'll throw that in chat and we'll have a we'll have some show notes for that as well yeah it looks like um and, and not again 75 dollars for the for the product right not terribly expensive i could see some areas where that might be uh, super handy as far as moving around or we we've had some problems with the Amazon lady where we uh, say something because I've got them in almost all the rooms now. Yes. And in fact, I've, I've, uh, we, we took one downstairs and we were using the, you know, yeah, we were just flex. using, mm -hmm, down there, this got pulled up, and so Sarah brought it to my desk, and I'm like, huh, I wonder where I'll use this. I mean, I, we literally have no other place to use this at the moment in the house. Every room's got one. And um, and I thought, well, in the nope, I got one of them in the garage. I put a flex in the garage, which is a, a great a great application for it. It's way in the back of the garage, so it's not not likely to pick up somebody standing at the front of the garage. Yes, yeah. Um, so, and, you know, the garage door has a security code on it and some of those kinds of things, just so that those, those shenanigans don't happen. Um, forgot where I was going with this. I got too, I got too, <laughs> I got too wrapped into the sensor. It's been a long day. I, I, I really you were thinking have. about the everything presents one and some of the things you would do with it. I yeah, just, I yeah. just ordered one of each, <laughs> uh, like this week. So I have an everything presents okay. one, everything presents one light on its way to me. And I'm looking forward to that. And that ties in, great with home assistant and reviews have been great too yeah yeah well it's i wonder oh i remember i was going with it so with these we we will 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 ask one to do something and the one all the way across on the other side of the room is the one to answer you know and you, you kind of wish there was a little bit smarter proximity like to what we're talking here where it'd be like, well, no, I'm going to answer to the one where I sense the, the, the voice or the body coming from, right? This could be an answer to that to say, no, I'm going to use the device that's closest because we ask it to start playing music. I don't want to hear the music in the one in the living room. I want it, the one that's right there in the kitchen. So maybe that could be an answer to it. Yeah, and and that's a known thing. Uh, over the years, I've noticed that some days it's better than others. Like yeah, you don't know yeah, what they're yeah. updating in the background, but some right. days the one in, like I have an Echo Pop sitting in front of me. It's one of their newer ones, and honestly, the microphone in this thing is awful. Mm. I could yell at it and it still wouldn't answer. But I have the <laughs> the dots in the other rooms are answering to me, and it drives me nuts sometimes. Like I almost uh -huh. just like give it away at this point. It's not yeah. worth it. Yeah. Like, what do I have you for if you're not going to answer? <laughs> you have one job. <laughs> you have just one. And they're, and they're kind of specialized, too, when you think about it. You know, like I've got one of these in the garage because I don't need the camera or I, in it. I just wanted to plug it into an outlet that's out there. But we've got one in the bedroom that's got the clock on it, yes. which is super, super helpful. And then in the rooms, like uh, in some of the other rooms, we're just using the smaller pucks, the dots, whatever, right? The, finally, the original just went out. So the original one we had in the kitchen uh, crapped out. So we got a bigger 8-inch in there, and that's great in the kitchen, right? So starting to get some of that, um, you know, right tool for the right job in the right place, doing the right, yes. the, the right thing. One of the things uh, this week we had, you know, I've got, so I wouldn't say it's smart, but we have a fairly, we have a touch-sensitive faucet. That, you yes. know, you turn it on, it's got an LED light, blue for cold, red for hot, tap it on, tap it off. The next gen, which I really want to get, is 
you is enabled smart enabled where you can say turn on the water to this temperature right and it'll turn it on and bring it up to the temperature that's what i really want but so the 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 uh faucet had been getting lower and lower pressure and then it started making a funny noise like you know this grinding screeching you know so I checked everything. I went through, pulled all the stuff, pulled the batteries, replaced the batteries, checked the, uh, disconnected it, checked the water pressure to make sure it wasn't maybe, I thought maybe something had gotten in the, the actual pipes going in. Pulled the, pulled the sensor. Uh, you know, there's a mixing valve in that, right? Cold and cold and hot go into one and that mixes it for it. I could hear it clicking on and off. So I cut the, it it's got a wire that's it, our version's permanently attached to the to the faucet, or it's it's screwed in at a spot I'm not I can't reach anymore because it's way up in there. So I snipped it, I took it out. We just hot wired it together. So I took that out. You can hot wire them together. We're not getting the touch sensor anymore. But I was like, well, maybe the whole sensor's gone. I looked it up. One hundred and fifty dollars replaced. Yeah, I can, now you're gonna have well, to buy a new one with all the smart with the in there. with the smart oh. stuff in it. I thought, well, so I go, I I I get a video, and the guy says, yeah, the most common problem with pressure is the filter basket inside the mixing switch. So I <laughs> screwed it, pulled that thing out. It's this little, this I, it's no bigger than than half an inch, just packed <laughs> full of. You know, stuff that comes through Calcium your water pipes. Blah, blah, yeah, blah. just just comes through. So I took a little, I took a little uh, toothpick, just junk coming out. That wasn't a lot, but it was certainly enough to plug it up. So no, no new faucet. Oh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hook it back up. It, it'll Why work just fine. It? <laughs> it'll work. Just, it was one of those things. Yeah, I know. You're like that's that's a real like those those faucets now are like six hundred dollars. Yeah, like those, and you're like. Well, do I, is now the time or do I want to kind of wait or, you know, once you bypass that thing and I, you get all this water pressure again, you're like, okay, it was just that thing. So sometimes I'll be, I'll be honest. There's not a lot of these smart things you can fix anymore. Right. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think pulling that apart and pulling that out and it even, it didn't even look bad initially when I was looking at it straight on, but as I turned it upside down, you know, blue on the other end and this thing comes out and it's just loaded with garbage in there. So I'm not going to get my start. I'm not going to get my smart, um, faucet. Do you, you guys have any, are you using any smart faucet stuff for the kitchen or have any of that kind of stuff? Not yet. Would you? Um, if I ever got to that point, like I guess my mentality now is if I have to buy something new, Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'd see, you know, I, I, one, I check, is there a smart version of it? And two, the second thing I check is, uh, does it work with home assistant? Right. And I'll make my purchasing decisions sometimes on that. But then it also, sometimes you find when it's a smart one, it's like the price difference is huge. And sometimes you're like, uh, is it really worth it just to be able to tell it to turn on the water? It's got to give me some value. Well, I do a lot of, I, our dishwasher started etching our wine glasses. We would pull them out and they would have this, the jet cleaner stuff was kind of etching the glasses, just kind of making them ugly. And I thought, well, I'm just going to start, um, I'm just going to start uh, hand washing. Tony's giving us a little feedback. He says, you sound a little distant. Bring your mic in there a little bit. We'll, see, right. if that, we'll see if that fixes it. Um, uh, Auphonic is going to fix it in post-production. So we're going to be just, we're going to be just fine. Okay. But, um, uh, so I started hand washing our glasses because I want them to look nice, right? Well, that's a perfect application because that I want the water hot, but I don't want it so hot it burns my fingers, which it does sometimes. So there was I would get it to a point where I get the exact temperature, degree temperature that I want, 104. Let's just say I'm making that up. That could be that could be totally wrong, but I'd want to say, hey, lady, turn on the faucet to 104. And it would, you know, come on yeah. and start. And then it'd take a while to get there, but it would adapt it. So that would be the that would be the use case for me. I don't know. Chat room, what do you guys think? If you were going to have a faucet that was smart, 
what other kinds of applications would you use it for? Whether on YouTube, you can leave it in the comments down below or, or throw it in the chat uh, for our live folks. I think uh, Moen, is it Moen that has yeah. a smart one? But yep. they, they also have Delta features where too. you can say, give me two cups of water. Mm. And then it, there you, you go. I no longer need a measuring cup. I just put any cup under there and fill there two you cups go. of water. And that's, that's, to me, that's a feature that I would use a lot because I'm always grabbing a measuring cup to find six cups of water or something like that. Right. Yeah. 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 What if you could say, give me two cups of water at room temperature, right? Or they give can it, possibly you know, do that too. Yeah. 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 What if I had a kitchen robot that would just do all that for me? <laughs> <laughs> Cook dinner for you too. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Tony out in chat says uh, whole house shut off, but I, I don't know if I trust a smart faucet just yet. Um, yeah, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know, Tony, what there is to not trust on those, but I get it. I get your point. Um, uh, Joe says if you could specify a temperature, yeah, I think the yeah. temperature and what you're talking about, you know, give me two cups or I need six or, um, yeah, I don't know what else chat room. Tell us, tell us what what, what else you think. While we're thinking of that, um, oh, this is a good one. Brian says maybe something to warm the pipes in the winter. So they don't burst. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. may be something where it senses the outside temperature. That would be, well, I mean, there's all these devices. Um, and I can't remember the, what's the orange one that goes on your power. You know, it's got the little clamps and it, it makes an attempt to learn your different um, sense. Uh, yeah. Sense is what it is. Uh, something like that for your water. I know, I know they have pipe warmers where you yeah. wrap it around yeah, your yeah. pipes that go externally yeah. and that will warm the pipes, but this would be smart. You don't even need to warm it, but you just run the pipe for a little bit because sometimes they say if you leave a little trickle, your pipe won't freeze because it can't freeze running water, right? So that that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe says out in chat, he says, I ordered my wife a new Bosch dishwasher. Trade off for buying ammo in a new Pixel 8. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, well, you can get we those to, things later. We <laughs> just have to, yeah. Well, it's it's crazy. Um, you know the the dishwasher. I remember when we changed out our last one. How much quieter the and you know we changed our air conditioner uh, recently as well. I have a brand new Ream air conditioner out there, and I can't even hear it. Like it's yeah. so quiet. Now it's it's much larger, but it's it's more efficient. I hope and um, so much more quieter out there. And I, you don't even hear it come on anymore. Yep. Even and the new like, furnaces, they, they come on in multiple multiple stages. Mm -hmm. And the low stage, mm -hmm. you barely hear this thing, but it still keeps you warm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to need to, I, I still have to reinstall that, that, uh, the, the mixing unit here. I've got it. And, and I just snipped the wire. So I'm going to need to, <laughs> I'm going to need to rig those up with a little bit of, with a little bit of tubing. I've got some of that, that, uh, flex tubing that you can put in there so yeah. I'll put it together put it around it you know do a lighter and uh, and have it what a shrink shrink tubing shrink wrap. Yep, shrink, and yep, uh, we'll shrink, get shrink. that uh, i may i may do i may add extra wire to that or something so that i can in the future i don't have to if i ever have to pull that off to service it again i don't have to cut it type deal yeah. that would be the or you could get the wago clips i use those a lot oh yeah they're just, they're just like you know the little clips and you just little snaps them, yeah and they snap yeah together. Little snap and If you clips. have to remove them in the future, you just that's good idea. Them and pull it out. That's, that's a good idea. We'll we'll give that you, you. I'll give that a try here. Right? You can pick that those up at any hardware store, right? Yes, those yeah. are available. Or or Amazon next day. We'll get that. We we'll get that sent in. Hey, uh, I get this question in my. I have this question all the time, and I don't. I still don't really understand it. Zigbee, Z Wave. I hear Richard, who you were just on home on. Yeah. Uh, no, not home no. on uh, entertainment 2.0. Yeah. Right. But he's done home on. All I hear from them, Zigbee Z Wave, blah, 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 blah. Is it, what's the difference? And is anybody using them anymore? I mean, it, they seem like nobody's, yeah, talk a little bit about that. So, so Zigbee versus Z Wave is almost like the Mac versus PC type of argument, okay. right? Okay. In, in the smart home space, you have people that are, love one or the other. And they always, I always get this question a lot is, which one's better? Which one should I go with, et cetera, et cetera? And I'm just like, 
have both of them. You don't need to stick to just <laughs> one, you know, like, but people want to stick to just one and have an alliance and, you know, be yeah. part of the group yeah. and stuff. Yeah. I personally like them both. And what they are, they're just basically communication standards. So Z-Wave runs at a certain frequency. They communicate a certain way. ZB runs at another frequency, communicates a different way. Um, they don't interact with each other. So unless you have a controller that does both of them, then that's how you can get them to work together. But uh, my personal opinion, just have them both in your house because what you'll find is Z-Wave devices are usually more expensive, right? You get the Zigbee devices, you'll get all those cheap devices. And it comes down to licensing, I believe, on uh, why one's more expensive than the other. But the Zig, you'll get certain devices you can get in Z-Wave only, but you can't get a Zigbee version of it. Or you get a Zigbee version of another device, but you can't get a Z-Wave version. So why ever limit yourself to that and just have both networks in your house? So if you're going to have a smart home controller, make get one that has both Zigbee and Z-Wave. In my home assistant, I have a ten, an antennas for both of them, right? Um, and that way, I don't limit myself to anything. In terms of the meshes, though, my Z-Wave mesh, all my, all my switches in my house are Z-Wave. So that handles the mesh for Z-Wave. Now, my Zigbee devices, they're scattered throughout the house, but they also build their own little mesh amongst it too, right? So I have enough mesh for each of them. And if I needed a, a specific to extend my Zigbee mesh a little more, I can put in a Zigbee plug that acts as a repeater and it will take care of that for me, right? But don't limit yourself to just one, have both. You know, I, what I do recommend is limit yourself to a few manufacturers, right? And, and you'll find that their devices work better. So all my switches are in a valley. I'm a big fan of theirs. Um, all my sensors are actually zoos. I'm a big fan of theirs. But then I have Zigbee devices like my Aquara, you know, curtain controllers. You know, I have a few Aquara devices that are Zigbee only. And then you're going to hear a lot of people talk about Matter, right? Um, Matter is the new standard that was kind of put together by all the oh, yeah. big yeah, people yeah. and stuff like that. Um, I have a Matter controller. I have a few Matter devices. I'm not a fan of Matter. Um it feels like it's just another standard. I've had problems with it, but it's still in early stages. So if you're going to look for Matter, you can wait for Matter. Um, the number of devices on Matter right now are very limited. And sometimes when you get certain devices on Matter, like they just don't have all the features. So you may be able to turn it on and off, but you don't get things like battery reporting you know, into Home Assistant. And that would drive me mad. So I would go back to the old standard and connect it the other way, right? So... But still have matter if you're because in the future, matter is going to be a normal thing and you'll probably end up with matter devices at some point. So you might as well have that network, too. Right. So I have about five, I think, different networks of like I have Bluetooth, matter, Zigbee, Z-Wave, and I do use the RF, you know, at times. So I don't limit myself to any technology because the whole point of Home Assistant is you can bring them all together. Um, so, you know, I'm running my home assistant off of a PC and yep. so to get the various transmitters or receivers or whatever you want to say, I'd need to put something, I'm assuming at this point I would need some kind of Zigbee and Z-Wave. Do they make transmitters that are both that I could, could I put one device in or am I going to have to buy a bridge or something for, for either one of them individually if I wanted to have both? Um, if you like... You you want to buy individually. I buy individually okay. just because um, if I wanted to change out one of them, I wouldn't lose both of them. So I have a Zigbee controller. My Zigbee controller thinks of Sonoff, Zigbee 3.0. Um, my Z-Wave controller, I did have an AOTech 500. And, you know, uh, the one thing I do argue is the 500 series of chips was one of the best in terms of, like, just reliability. Um, but... I did have a 700 at one point and I had nothing but issues with that. And I just this week upgraded to the 800 series controller for Z-Wave. Um, so I'm not really like, it hasn't been long enough for me to give judgment yet on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I had some growing pains in there, but I'm still trying to figure it out. But um, that controller, I can easily switch out without affecting anything else. And that's the other thing too. When you split up all these devices too, if my Z-Wave goes down, it doesn't affect my Zigbee, right? Mm -hmm. Or if I want to migrate, I only had to migrate half of them on 94 devices, I think, on Z-Wave, right? So 
And then for Matter, I use the um, Home Assistant has their own device that that they, oh, what's the name of it? I'm having a brain freeze right now, but Home Assistant has their own device and it's a Zigbee Matter um, in one, but I actually turned off the Zigbee and I only use the Matter side of it. Would, uh, I'm a big fan, or I was a big fan of Hubitat and yep. they have, they, they, you know, some of their devices have both Zigbee and Z-Wave built into it right so they 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 can detect those yes. would it make although i don't like their dashboards and i ended up using home assistant for that could i mix those two together could i have habitat doing some of the control but having the dashboards in in home assistant would it would that work to do it that way yeah you there's actually a connector there's a home assistant connector and you install it in habitat it basically just uh, it, it just exposes all the Hubitat devices to Home Assistant and then mm -hmm. lets Home Assistant can control them and control stuff like them. that. So, yeah. yeah, some people would, uh, when they started, when I first started with a Home Assistant, I didn't have any antennas and I came from Hubitat. So I had all my devices actually on Hubitat through their antennas, but then all my control and um, dashboards and everything was on Home Assistant. And then as I bought like a Zigbee antenna, I'd migrate those devices over. So, you know, nothing wrong with that too because the speed's pretty good. Yeah, good little devices. They're C8. I think I have a C5, which is an older uh, an older one. They have now C7, which is the one without the antennas. And the C8 does have antennas. 150 for the C8 US prices. 99 for the US, or uh, 99 USD for the C7, um, they run deals on them all the time. So never buy Habitat yeah. stuff, right? Uh, Black never Fridays, they're going to be their next yeah. deal. And go with yeah. the C8, my advice, it will be so much better for you. Yeah, it's a pretty good pretty good little device. And that would be one way, right, of doing it if you wanted to get into that and avoid. Because it's it's got a bunch of stuff built into it, both Z-Wave and Zigbee. Uh, Wi-Fi kind of built into it, its own power supply, ready to go, ready to plug into your network, and it just starts picking stuff up. Pretty good at that. Yeah. I did get a little confused when I was using both Home Assistant and uh, Habitat for a while. You'd be like, okay, where did I program that at? Like, yeah. which which devices use is making this work, right? I mean, because they both, they're both, this, I don't want to say they're the same thing, but they kind of do the same thing, right? Habitat and Home Assistant, very similar from that standpoint, right? Yeah, um, but with, with Home Assistant, you have so much more control over what antenna you want. So if you didn't like this antenna, you can swap it. But keep in mind in Hubitat, I had the Hubitat C4, I think it was at one point, and that was a 500 series chip. Then I upgraded to the C7, which was the 700 series, and I had nothing but issues with that one. Like mm. device, devices mm. just dropping, and that was a Z-Wave issue right so they actually release firmware updates but it was actually with z-wave that the problem is and yeah. i really don't think they got the reliability of that down on the z-wave side um because even when i moved to home assistant i got you know a brand new controller i got the latest updates on it and it still gave me problems and i just went back to the 500 so the c8 though for habitat i believe that's the 800 series chip with the long range built in which is very interesting um, if you're going to get into long range with Z-Wave, those devices can uh, transmit data for like a mile or something more like that. So like it's, yeah. it's ridiculous. That's a very big yeah. selling point of it. But we're yeah. still waiting on a lot of the long range devices to come out and stuff like that, right? Okay. okay. Yeah, picking up your neighbors. Picking up your neighbor's <laughs> stuff. For sure. We talked about that before. Um, with Dave being on the show uh, last week, if you haven't listened to the show, uh, this will be a little bit of a spoiler. Dave talked a lot about 3D printing in that and and how he's using that with a CNC in the shop and such. But um, uh, are you, did have you, do you have a 3D printer? Have you picked yeah. one up? Are you thinking about that? Is that fairly new? Talk a little bit about your experience so far. So I was very curious about the 3D printing world. And, you know, in the past, I'd look at it and I'd see too much like, confusion you know it, it looked too complicated right and then re yeah. more recently sure. it started to get a lot better and people were talking about prusa so i know dave went with um he went out with a chinese brand i can't remember the name of uh, bamboo right yeah, and yeah. that's another one but that one's a little more expensive so i was looking at prusa but what i did was I just put a watch out on Kijiji and Facebook Marketplace, and I said, you know, if somebody has a Prusa, maybe at this this price point, I'll jump on it, right? Because I didn't want to spend the $1,000 on it, right? 
And somebody had one up. I think I got it for six hundred dollars Canadian. Uh, MK3S. So it was pretty much the newest, latest one. Um, I was like, yeah, you know. Otherwise, it's over a thousand dollars for me. I was like, I ran over. I grabbed it off him. Um, he all assembled. He showed me test prints. He explained it to me. It works beautifully, and I'm now in the 3D printing world. Um, I've been 3D printing tons of stuff. That's the MK4 you're showing on the screen. Which one did you get? The MK3S Plus. S Plus. We'll yes. show that one, okay. Right. So yep, this, the, one, this one right here, right? The S Plus. Yeah. View details. Go to it's that. a beautiful device. It works really great. Um, I have no complaints about it. Uh, Self leveling bed, all the fun features, and they seem to they have a very good community. Yeah, about a, a priced about the same, right? Six fifty off the website, I think. Well, Dave's was more like a grand, I think, when when he was. Well, this is the lower price because they have their MK four now, right? So they've reduced the price. You used to pay. I think it was eight hundred dollars unassembled. If you nope. wanted it assembled, then you pay. Uh, I think it was a thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, no, I think it was nine and a thousand dollars, and it depended on if you wanted them to assemble it or you assemble it yourself. And assembling was like an eight-hour job, yeah. right? Like yeah. so, it wasn't. It was something some people like doing. I personally probably wouldn't have liked doing it, so I got yeah. mine pre-assembled. I'd break it for sure. And yeah, the, that's uh, the worst so. part. But yeah. yeah. It's a great little printer. Um, I haven't had any problems with it. I was sitting in my basement. I put it in like a little heat um, dome so it keeps all the temperature in there and keeps the heat stable. Uh, I even have it tied into Home Assistant. So Home what? Assistant, yeah, <laughs> like like Home Assistant tells me you know the length of the print, how long it's gonna take. It tells me when it's done. I actually have it set up so when the print starts, it turns on the lights in there. Um, and then I have a camera on it so I can see the printer and everything going through. And that's on a home assistant dashboard, right? <laughs> so it, it's, it's really cool what it can do. A little, that, a little bit of that is a little extra, um, yeah. you know, you had to get like a, another program to actually do all that stuff, but it, it works really nice. Dave had mentioned, and you just said it a second ago, the community matters around this yeah. stuff. Right. Yeah. And I'm assuming similar, you can buy or download plans. Someone's probably designed. And I'm assuming the plans, if I created a print plan for this, that's not going to be cross compatible with the bamboo one that Dave, the, they're fairly proprietary to the printer. Is, no. Would you, would you say that or no, they, 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 they could go ahead. If you get the STL files or you get the CAD files or something like that, you, yep. you just send it to the printer. Um, or as a G code, you do, you send it to the slicer and the slicer takes like that design and slices it up and then creates like a mm. printer specific G code. And it could okay. be even with, with Prusa's printers, it could be different for each of their printers. Right. Okay. So it, it's really cool gotcha. how it works, but gotcha. I, I'm now in the design phase where I actually design my own stuff now and I slice it up. I don't post anything because a lot of it's just been for personal designs. But one mm -hmm. thing you did ask him last week is, is it starting to pay for itself? Yeah. I remember that yeah, question. Yeah. I thought I was yeah. thinking about that actually a couple of weeks before that, because we got, I got the new iPhone, for example, and in the cars, I have um, uh, car mounts for them all. Right. So I was like, oh, I'm going to have to rebuy new car mounts. Right. But I said, why do I have to do that? I'll just print my own. So I designed my own car mount with the MagSafe charger in it, and mm -hmm. it just goes on. And you know that cost me like two dollars in material, where mm -hmm. the new the new add-on for my Pro Clip series would have cost me fifty dollars each. So I saved a hundred bucks right there, and spent, you know, boom, already, you know, like it's making money for me. That's that's just one <laughs> example. <laughs> making money right now. That's just one making example. Money. <laughs> No, it's a good one. I mean, it's a good, it's, it's a real world. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a real world example of, of things we would, you know, regular people would use it for. Right. It, although Gavin, you're, I mean, there, there's not a lot of things you can't do. Like you write code for, for home assistant, you've been driver stuff for Hubitat, blah, you know, do you think the average guy could, could get, you know, get a file, 
put it together, send it over to the printer and make his own, um, you know, phone holder for the car. Are we asking too much there or do you think that's possible? Like everything, it just takes time. Like if the average guy doesn't have time, then you're go probably, it. yeah, <laughs> go yeah. yeah. just go buy your, your car holders, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. but if yeah. you have time on your hands, then yeah, it's that it's actually not that hard. Cause I taught myself. Right. So it's just, it just takes that time and you make mistakes. Yeah. You know, and you learn from those mistakes and you say, Oh, if I want to make a, you know, a screw hole, I can do it this much faster or easier. And that's all it takes. I think the average guy can do all this stuff. It just takes time to understand it and yeah. learn it. And I think a lot of people don't want to spend the time. Even when I talk to TJ and Seth, they're like, they, they're amazed. But yeah. when they ask me how I do it, you know, just, I'm just like, Well, you got to do this. And they're like, Oh, that's too much time. <laughs> right. like, i just want to take something out of the box stick it to the wall and it works yeah. you know yeah. i'm like uh yeah you need yeah. to just spend the time i you know i've gotten that feeling from our community to just a, not just these kinds of things but stuff overall like we used to spend all kinds of time with computing stuff computers and messing around with drivers and getting stuff to work and now it's like, no, actually, I just want to put the hard drives in and power it up and I get the rate automatically. And I can, you know, I just kind of wonder if overall we have generally lost that drive, that inquisitiveness to kind of do it ourselves. Not everybody has. I'm sure there's plenty out there who have. Yeah. Well, in fact, I'd love to hear from you if you're listening to the podcast version of this. And there's something where you like spending the time doing it. I'd love to know. Send me an email, jim at the average guy TV and, and uh, let's dialogue a little bit on that. Uh, because I think I just don't do as much of that troubleshooting. I mean, I remember you used to troubleshoot stuff to like three in the morning, you know, and you'd be like, Oh, I got to go to bed. Now I'm like, it's 10 o'clock. I, I have that. Maybe I'm just getting older to the point where you're like, yeah, that's going to take me too long. I'm going to bed, <laughs> you know, type deal, right? Yeah, um, I'm the same way too. Like I used to build PCs, for example. I used to love that, buying the parts, putting it together. Now to me, a PC is just a tool. I, I, I'll i just buy a Dell, right? Something pre-configured. Uh, it has everything I want and I don't really have to think about it. It works with Windows. I don't have to troubleshoot, you know, like that's one of the things I find that I don't want to spend my time on is troubleshooting hardware issues on a PC. <laughs> Right. So I, I do just want certain things to work. And to me, a computer should just work. Yeah. Well, they didn't used to. <laughs> they used to have all kinds of problems. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and Brian, Brian out in chat says, uh, I'd love to get a 3D printer, but I know I wouldn't print enough volume to make it worth my while. Wish my local library had uh, options to do 3D print. And when we had Sammy on, my daughter, um, our, our local library, th a stone's throw from here has, has a really nice 3d printer and for nothing i mean i could it'd be hard to spend ten dollars down there yeah. i could go down i just need to do it i just need to go down and tr get something and and um and print some stuff down there just to catch the bug right <laughs> you know uh but although i'll buy it and i'll never use it so uh, print something that you'll use so one of the first things i actually printed was a not new nozzle for my, my um blower my leaf blower so oh, I yeah. found a design mm -hmm. on, I didn't design this one. I found a design on online. It yeah. was for my model. I said, all right, four and a half hour print. I printed it. It's still sitting on my leaf floor now. And I'm like, that's something I use. Cool. Yeah. 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 No, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Now you're looking, looking around. <laughs> looking around at all my junk down here. <laughs> you look at things differently though when you have a three D printer. You're like, oh, I I could use a handle on there. Oh, I'll just print a handle. Oh, or I need a headphone holder. Oh, I'll just print a headphone holder. Yeah, you know yeah. things hooks, like that, right? Yeah, hooks and things like that would probably. I, 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 I listen. I know guys that have three D printers and they have little chashki chashkis all around there of th little things they've printed to hang stuff on or whatever. Yeah. Right, those kinds of things. So. All right. Well, I, that's two in a row, two shows in a row. We talked about 3d printing. I listen, that was, I, it's taken 3d printing forever to take off and I'm not sure it's, it's not still, it's, yeah. it's not even mainstream. Right. I mean, I, do you think it ever will be mainstream or it'll be very specialized? 
No, as they get better, as they get better. Um, one of the issues is when things go wrong, you have to troubleshoot it, you know, like you'll get the spaghetti or, you know, it won't stick to the bed. There's still things that you still got to fight with the printer about. Um, eventually, I think they'll get to it with the material and the bed and the speed to the point where anyone could just print it like how you have your home printer, mm -hmm. right? And you could just print whatever. But I think still, it's still a hobbyist thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. Well, I'll keep I'll keep my eyes. I just need to go down to the library. That'd be the smartest. That'd be the smartest way to go. Uh, last time you were on, we spent a little bit uh, time talking about smart lawn watering, and we you almost almost convinced me to buy some moisture sensors for the lawn. I never did. I didn't. I did not pull the trigger on them. Um, we we had the weirdest year. It was dry in the spring. It rained the entire month of July. It was super hot in August, and then I had the guy from uh, from um, your green. No, is that right? Uh, shoot, I should know that. Uh, that's probably embarrassing that I can't. Uh, yeah, yeah, your green uh, on talking about that highly specialized sprinkler. Give us, Gavin, tell us what you've been doing and what you found out over the course of the summer. So one of my goals this summer was actually to get more, to automate my um, watering a little more based on sensor feedback. So one of the things I tried to find were soil mo moisture sensors that worked somewhat well. And it, surprisingly, there were a lot out there, but not a lot of them would work really well. Mm. And I bought a whole bunch of different brands to try them all out. And I just came through elimination. I came down to the EcoWit soil mo moisture sensors. Now... One of the things I did not like about those sensors originally was they stuck out of the ground, yeah. right? They had a little red light. I put a little piece of tape over that light, but they stuck out of the ground. And I understand that. But when I looked at everything else that was out there, this was like the only one that worked really well um, and, and did what it had to do. So I said, you know what? I'll bite the bullet for now. And if something better comes out later, then I can switch over. Well, you know, now is the end of the year and I've just pulled them out of the ground. And I can honestly say over the year, I've saved quite a bit in terms of watering. So I have a rat ratio um, system set up. And with those, you just kind of program them and you say water every week and they do their little math or AI stuff. And they say, oh, this week you don't have to water as much and stuff. I never found it to be that accurate. Like I just didn't like it. So I it through Home Assistant. I would take the moisture values of, you know, all the sensors. And I had like a little automation set up that every night at 945, it would calculate um, the moisture in the soil. Um, and, and then based on one, what I want it to be, if it's not in that range, like if it's too low, the second value, I kind of had it calculated over time, like almost like a flow rate. So how much, how long it had to run to go up 1%. So if I wanted it to jump 15%, it knew it had to, in this zone, run 15 minutes, for example. And then it would calculate all that at night. And then the next morning before sunrise, it would start um, the zones, only the zones that needed the water. Mm. Uh, in a certain time, it calculated what time it had to start it and then finish right before sunrise. And over the course of the summer, I found that I used a lot less water because I wasn't watering areas that didn't need it. Um, I found certain parts of my lawn were actually drier, like they got drier faster because they sat in the sun more, where the ones that were under the, the trees, um, they didn't lose the moisture as much. So because of that, I actually used a lot less water. It triggered, you know, a lot shorter time too, because Ratio would just go for an hour, an hour and a half sometimes in a zone where this would say, no, you only need 50 minutes of it, right? Yeah, And yeah, yeah, right yeah. now we were talking about before the show, I know your lawn's gone dormant, but my neighbor yeah, today was yeah. saying, you got to cut your lawn one more time. I don't even <laughs> have my water. It's not running. It hasn't been running for a month or two now. Like yeah. it's been like very good, but he actually said, you're going to have to cut your lawn one more time. You still have the greenest lawn in the neighborhood. Right. And I think that's just the, you know, from the fact that I didn't overwater it, I didn't yeah. underwater it. I just had it at one zone one, and it just took care of itself. And yeah. I will be doing this again next year. Um, I, it, it was so successful. Yeah. You, I show, I think I showed the, by the way, congratulations on successfully. You don't, you don't hear those stories that, that yeah. very often, right. Of like, you know, yeah, it actually did save me some water and it's only yeah. going to get more expensive. Right. And um, I think, um, I, I, 
like if you're gonna buy these, buy a couple extra because I think there's some people, some kids in the neighborhood that love to go and jump on them, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I, no, I honestly think they're just they're doing laps around the neighborhood and they run across my lawn. So I kept yeah. finding one getting broken, right? Uh, so I kind of moved it to the edge of the lawn, out of right. the way, and they lasted right. a lot longer. But then I found another one broken the other day, so I'm like. You know what? That's thirty-five why bucks. Them. They're not. They're not cheap, right? I mean, yeah, but terribly expensive. But exactly. Still. But for yeah. what I got out of it, I was, you know, I'm like, next year I, I'm trying to find something that sits flat in the ground. And yeah. yeah, I did get into the Geo Drops beta, right? So this is what they call Geo Drops. Uh, let me see. If Hold I can on. Let me let me get you. Let me get you full screen. There we go. Yeah. So this is the Geo Drops water sensor, right? Um, it goes in the ground. This battery all sits below the ground, but this top here is actually flat, right? So you can mow over it. You don't have to worry about it. It's just flat. You won't break it if you step on it. Um, the problem is I just got this and our season's ending. Mm -hmm. So testing it right now, I'll probably break it. Just the ground's kind of hard. No point, Right. Um, right. So I will be right. testing this next year. Uh, the other issue I have with this right now is there's a lot of AI. They're they're adding AI and stuff like that. But when it comes to integration, there's no integration with this with anything. So I can't really use it to automate my my sprinklers. And they say they will be doing something like that. I think it's going to be through IFTT. I don't like that. So I don't mm -hmm. know if I will. Um, and then the other thing I really turned me off of on this, right? With all their AI and stuff, it's going to be a subscription. Mm -hmm. All right. And when you have a yard and you want like five of these in your yard, that's going to add up pretty expensive yeah. for something you only use maybe six months of the year in my area. Right. Yeah. So uh, I will play with it next year when the season starts up again. And I got to worry about that type of stuff. But um, if they continue down that path, I might not stick with it. But it's got the design factor I want. Right, the flat design. That's the only yeah. thing I really like yeah. about it. Oh, I me me too. What are the so? There's a couple stakes on that thing, and then some some looks like some numbers and such. What what what's that for? That's the depth in the ground. So it measures um it measures the moisture at different depths in the ground. Ah, because that's yeah. what you want to know is right. you know what's the moisture at four inches, for example, or three inches. It will do all that type of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it's got so much like technology in this, but it's almost like if I can't integrate this with, with Home Assistant and you're going to charge me a subscription, uh, that's kind of. Yeah, it's a yeah. tough pill to swallow. It's a tough it pill is. to swallow. I, I watched because of our conversation earlier in the year, I watched my my front yard zones and you know the backyard. I put that fire pit in and it, it broke it up into some natural zones and I don't care as much. You know, the crazy thing is we had this period of drought in the, in August and stuff went dormant and started drying up and I panic every time. I'm like, Oh, I that, that grass needs some water desperately on it. Right. And so I'd hand water it just to make sure it's being, I'm being super efficient with it, which hand watering, it's not really that great for the grass. Like you, you, you never get enough on there. It doesn't sink in enough. Some of those kinds of things. But anyways, I would, I would always, I would, I would water, I would panic water. And then over the last three or four or five weeks, we've had these cool mornings and some dew and some rain, a little bit of rain. The grass looks great right yes, now. Yes. Like it looks great. And you're like, you know, in August I was in a panic. Like, you know, you think oh, it's never coming back. I've, 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 I've burned this thing. I'm going to burn this thing to the ground kind of thing. And just the other day I was out there and you're like, eh, it's fine. Cool season grass front has a uh, warm season grass, which is the Zoysa. So I was watching the zones just to kind of be like, you know, after we had the guys from, from ear green on, I was thinking, I wonder what this looks like. And sure enough, and that, you know, I get water that comes off the house and floods an area and that gets soaked into this, the top part of the grass. And then the bottom part, uh, it, uh, I got to water it to get it. But so I was watering that, but the top part of the grass, I wasn't watering because it would normally get rainwater from the house, but we didn't get any. And so the top part started <laughs> drying out faster than the bottom, you know, kind of thing. And it was one of those, you know, and I was like, why am I, why am I chasing this? Why? Every year I ask myself the question, like, why am I chasing this crazy stuff? So it's, Nah, I don't know, Gavin. I do. I love the. I love that the geo drop, 
those aren't out yet, right? That's a that's a still a product that has to launch. Uh, yeah, it hasn't launched yet, but they I believe they have an open beta now. So mm-hmm. if you can still get in on it, I don't know how many people they allowed in. Um, but like I said, it's the end of the season for me now. So yeah, yeah, no, you're not going to put them. You're not going to put them in the ground now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, the, by the time they got it to me, I was like, oh, too late now. <laughs> would be great as like t- flat sensors, twenty bucks. Yes, that would be that would be a really good price point, right? I think for some of those, I'd I'd buy four, maybe five at that price, hundred bucks. Put sensors on the line, get a feeling for where it is, and then run some zones or something. I I just don't I just don't know if I have enough grass to even make it worth doing all that for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, my my yard is shaped weird that I had to move the when I originally came in, I had to move the sprinkler like six times to get it and i only did that maybe twice and i said yeah. no i'm getting an irrigation system that's the first thing <laughs> yeah. i said i can't do this yeah. all the time you know? yeah yeah no i know my neighbors have irrigation next door <laughs> this is it's just crazy how how life works so they'd had some bushes and a big tree and they got to take it out in the spring and they had just replanted actually they hadn't for a while the tree as soon as we cut it down the tree went mad and started shooting up you know, uh, new trees everywhere. Like I swear to God, they were coming through the concrete. It was just so aggressive. So we just knocked all those down and then they, he had, uh, Oh, I don't know, four or five, six weeks ago had, had gone in and had, and had it all reseeded and aerated and it was coming back. It was looking great. And then they found out they needed to replace their sewer pipe. Oh. So, yeah, so uh, to dig it all up. They had to dig it all. It was a mess. They reseeded it, and it'll it'll come back just fine. Yeah, but yeah. it was looking good, and he uses irrigation. Some of that, uh, some of his sprinklers are hitting into my yard and my flower beds. So I moved some flowers around to be in the spots for next year. Where his irrigation sitting like I'm such a cheap, I'm so cheap. <laughs> Nothing so wrong cheap. with that. <laughs> you know, I thought, you know, might as well take advantage. We don't want to waste water. We'll put it into the plants and, yeah, and, exactly. and get it to go that way. So it's a never ending battle. Uh, Joe says uh, it's been dry there as well. He's down in, he's down in Arkansas. Um, and they're actually under a burn ban. You know, we're not, we've had some rain, so we're, it's not too bad here. Uh, and then Joe says he probably needs to mow one more time. Yeah. I have a couple mows in me just for the leaves, right? We're talking about that in pre-show. You got to get those leaves up. I just mow them up. It's just a lot yeah. easier. Just a lot easier. And then uh, Tony says his cold weather grass is starting to grow and green up nicely. Nice. Yeah, it's looking good for me. Yeah. yeah. Look at, looking good for me. Um, okay, let's end on this one. How about the pool? You've, we know you got a pool. You you do a bunch of smart stuff around it. Did you, with the summer, did you do anything different or anything new? For the yep. Pool? So with my pool, I usually have the pool pump switch automated. Um, I have the uh, pool temperature on an automation uh, device in there. But then I, I was curious and I added a second pool temperature device because my first device, I have mountain and skimmer. So I added one by the ladder because I was curious if the temperature changes at all throughout my pool. Mm-hmm. And one thing I found is they were all giving the same readings, right? Mm-hmm. So my pool throughout, I, I can leave my pump running all the time. So I wonder if it's just circulating the water that also helps that. But yeah, like you could just put your pool thermometer in the skimmer and you get the same temperature reading as if I had it on the ladder out in the open. So, you know, it was interesting to find that I found for myself just because I, I thought I would get different reading. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Different parts of the pool. So. Yeah. yeah different so sides sure. of the pool. But yeah. No, it was great. Um, and then yeah, just in terms of the temperature, having that was great because when we turn on the pool heater, for example, I have it notify us when it reaches our ideal temperature. So it's like, oh, pool's ready, you know, like time to jump in. And then the other thing I added was a pool. Um, this one I kind of made was a pool level monitor. So it's just a little float switch. And I have that also in my skimmer. And basically it's tied up to like a Z-Wave um, contact sensor, but you can add an external sensor to it. And it just monitors the level of the pool. And if it ever drops to a certain point, it kind of tricks the, you know, the whole sensor. And then it yeah. starts to notify me and it will turn off my pool pump. Because yes, that's happened to me where the water dropped. We had a leak. Water dropped. The pool pump was running dry for a while. It was my neighbor. So this now. Yes, indeed. 
simple. I, and this was also 3D printed. I designed and 3D printed oh. the case and the, the holder and the skimmer and everything myself. Um, nice. Mastodon, I posted pictures of it. It's all in one unit. Um, so again, another thing that paid for itself. But uh, it, it, that really printer cool. is already paid for itself. You're making money, <laughs> friend. You're making not money. yet, not yet, not <laughs> yet. As far as the wife's concerned, I am, but not yet, not yet. <laughs> but, but now, if the water ever drops, it will turn off the pump and notify me. Yeah. So it's just a yeah. safety thing. And uh, you know, yeah. like be, being burned once, you know, it's like okay, it's not going to happen again. Yeah. Well, I burned up. We had a pool, and I burned up the 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 pump by running it low and yeah. or, or with no water and yeah, that thing good. that's thing seized up tight like it just what it was done uh uncle marv's asking a question he says okay real question here how much does a pool uh, heater cost my wife wants one but i live in florida i don't see the need and i don't either uncle marv but but what's the cost to heat your pool up there well, in Florida, I don't know if you'll even need to heat the pool. It depends, because I guess, what, what temperature do you want? Or yeah, what? you probably would need to get a very robust heater. It might be nice, though, yeah. from time to time, right? Uh, it, it's some... all based on the gas, um, because ours runs off gas, right? So it, yeah. it's based on your gas rates, too, and stuff like that. Uh, and when we, do, we don't leave the pool heated, um, you can invest in something like a pool cover that will hold the heat in. We don't even do that. But what we do yeah. is, like... When we know we're going to use the pool, say on Saturday, I'll get up really early or set the time or no, I have to get up early because I didn't automate that and then go outside and turn on the heater. And then by the time we're ready, it's at the temperature. Yeah. Um, I honestly, in terms of the cost, I didn't really notice significant increase, but I wasn't heating it all the time. I know people that have heated it all the time. That will increase your gas bill significantly because um, it's going to try and keep what is it 60,000 liters of water or something like that like warm yeah. to, so although the the variance in daytime temperatures from where you are up in Canada versus where yes. he is down in Florida not as not as wide of a range and yeah. maybe a little easier to keep that thermal mass uh, up up higher so Uncle Marv what do you think what would you pay for a pool heater like the heater itself have you priced out the heater that you that you use? What would something like that do you think? What are those generally? Um, it's hard to say because every my neighbor installs these things, so okay. I get uh, I get friends' man. costs, so I can't really yeah. say. I never really ask them what the real cost is because yeah. then you gotta get the thousand thousand dollars. Yeah, you're looking at a thousand, <laughs> and then there's pre-COVID and post-COVID pricing too. It's significant, like things you are paying eight hundred dollars for, maybe sixteen hundred dollars now. I know it's ridiculous. So, yeah, yeah, so I, I get the feeling. He says when the iguanas freeze, I get the feeling. You know, <laughs> they get a couple cold days down there, uh, and maybe a couple cold weeks. And you know, I would think for them, maybe in the winter, if they know they're going to be home for a weekend, it might be nice to raise the temperature ten or fifteen yes. degrees right on the pool and. And then let it, let it sit. I would, I honestly, well, yeah, it'd be interesting. I used a solar heater. So I had a big black solar heater that I put out and that actually worked for my side of size of pool. We had a 20, 20 foot, 25 foot doughboy, you know, above ground pool. Yeah. So not a ton of water, but enough. And that worked out. Okay. You could feel, put your hand over it and feel hot water coming out of the, you know, coming out of it. I think in our environments, maybe not so much for Uncle Marv, but for us, the solar cover you put on it is, it's worth getting a really good one of those to hold in some of that heat. I probably would have insulated around the outside of the pool too, just to try to keep some of that thermal mass. Cause can you imagine how much water is, or how much heat is escaping just through the sides of, of the pool? above ground? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, one um, thing for Uncle Marv that, you know, you, you mentioned is they also have the solar heating. Um, it's basically like a little dome and it has a bunch of piping that's going in a circle in it. And you could put it on top of your roof. You could put it on top of whatever. So that's in the sun. And basically you have like a separate pump or the pump will push the water through that as well. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that heats up. And some people really like that and say that really helps. So, and that's cheap because you're just going to use the sun and, and the power to run the pump and that's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think there's 
double whammy on a furnace style pool heater because you're paying a lot for the equipment because it's yeah. running gas and then um then you have the gas itself right yes whatever whatever you're deciding to do that's why we no longer have a pool <laughs> <laughs> well the kids stopped swimming in it for that and I, i'm not a big pool guy so we we basically put it in for the for the uh, for the I just didn't say we put it in. We bought the house with it. And we swam for about six or seven years, and then the kids stopped swimming. And I'm like, Yeah, I know what you mean. Out. It, yeah. I will keep it hot tub if I ever buy a yeah. house. I would yeah. get a hot tub with it. It's yeah. so much nicer. Yeah, I don't. Know. I got a great spot for one. I probably should buy one. That would be the. That'd be the. Do way it. To go. Do it. That'd be the way to go. <laughs> that'd be the way to go. Oh, one last thing. You just got back from Cedia uh, in Denver. Spent some time with some of your podcast friends there. Is that worth going to? Like, for the average consumer, let's see, not even average consumer, the above average tech guy, gal, is that worth going to? Do you think? Uh, no, it's more of a pro uh, expo. So it stands, CDS stands for Custom Electronics Design and Installation Association. So they're in the pro market where, you know, y- y- the jobs will be, the equipment could be tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And it's not for the average guy. Um, it's more Wait, for the dealers. TD that comes out of the ground and yeah, unfolds itself. Yeah, yeah. How that, much is that thing? Oh, so that's the CC TV, and the one they had on display was the small one, the 165 inch. And this TV actually is made for outdoors. It folds up. I think it's four or five panels. They fold up, and then it goes down into the ground. <laughs> now the TV starts at about two hundred thousand dollars, I think. <laughs> and I think the installation will probably be like a hundred thousand dollars alone. Oh so my gosh! I don't think that's the average guy. I don't even think that's the what? above average guy. <laughs> What's what's like what what do you think of the use case for that is? What what do they where do they where Some, where, where do you put that pool. in? <laughs> what, where do you yeah, but well, yeah. I mean what where could where would you be that you couldn't have that okay, you say a pool. Well, that could be on the side of a pool house, right? Yes. And like what what kind of scenario where you'd want that thing to fold up and be put away in the ground? Right. And I'm sure that's all waterproof and all that other stuff. Yeah. I'm just trying to think what's the use case for that. If money is no object, you don't really have a use case <laughs> for it. Right. Like that, that's my <laughs> thought. You know? If money's <laughs> no object, you don't yeah. need a use case. Yeah, yeah. I want. So there it is. I, I just find that it would be frustrating because I want to turn on the TV and see it right away. But now I got to wait for this a couple <laughs> minutes to unfold <laughs> itself. Yeah. And then it gets stuck. Uh, yeah, well, no, nah, for that price, it better not, not get stuck. But it can detect things like wind. And if the wind starts to pick up, it will actually auto fold itself and close. Oh, it has all these other smarts man. in it. So yeah. that's what you get for, you know, that's probably a $50,000 add on. 250,000, a quarter of a million dollars for a TV. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to watch a lot of TV to have that make sense. I thought I was crazy when I put a 40 inch TV out on the deck near 30, I guess it's 32 or 35 or something mm-hmm. like that. But, but, uh, man, that's a hundred and what hundred and how big, how many inches? That one was 165 inch. That okay. was the one they had at the show and it was, it was Multiple impressive panels. watching it. Um, but they also have a bigger one. I think it's 205 inches or something like that. So, wow. you know, it, it's pretty amazing. Every time it fold, they only folded it like twice a day. Yeah. And every time they folded it, I missed it. <laughs> Right. So I, I really wanted to see it actually fall. And I, I missed it. I was only there for two days and I missed it both days. That's hilarious. Well, uh, and not the average guy stuff and no, nothing no. we'll ever buy, but, but couldn't cool nonetheless. I mean, they yes. Hey, they got to do some of that kind of stuff for, for, for the wow factor. Most of us are just going to buy either an outdoor TV or in my case, just a rate. I, you know, I just was on Amazon or whatever, and you can get some great TVs for like 199 bucks. Throw that thing on your deck, like, or whatever, right? I actually moved mine so it's underneath the eaves. If I happen to go to bed and forget to pull it in the house, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly protected. Well, one I, thing I did yeah. see at Cedia that you would like for the average guy is yeah. to actually yeah. have a, outdoor tv case and you'll see it on amazon so it actually is a hard shell case that company was actually there um and you know that's something we can afford so if you want to protect your investment yeah what do you feel how do you feel about leaving a tv outside 
Do you think it's, do you think it's like, I mean, I live in a, I live in a fairly good neighborhood. I'm not too worried about it, but I, I still not super thrilled about leaving the TV outside. I don't know. You, any, would you, are, are you afraid of theft? Or are you afraid of yeah, the temperature? It's fairly open. It? We, we live in a fairly open neighborhood concept, you know, not a lot of high fences. Everybody's yards blend in everybody else's. And I'm not worried about my neighbors. It's just, you know, locks are meant for honest people, right? And if, if it's out there, you know, somebody's walking by, like, you know, it's, think of all the videos in where people are stealing stuff off porches. And yes. I'm just kind of thinking, whoop, you know, it's like eating their light. <laughs> you carry it underneath your your arm, you know? So, yeah, I don't know. That's that. Yeah, I'm just thinking about somebody saying, oh, there's a TV back there, you know? Well, if you look at that case, the case comes with a lock and everything on yeah. it. It's a hard shell case. So you can actually, you know, it's not like just a little plastic cage, but you can also buy ones with heating and stuff in it too. So it would work in the cooler yeah. amounts. It would, you know, yeah. it would also keep the moisture out. So right. if you really want to keep it out there, I'd get a case. I, I would be yeah. fine with keeping it out there, but I'd put it in one of these cases. Yeah. And they're not easy to just rip off the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Uncle Marv says in the chat, he says, when they built their patio, everyone told us just to buy a regular TV because it was under a roof. Yes. Uh, outdoor TVs weren't worth the money. And they're not, I did price outdoor TVs and they're not terrible. They're not cheap, but they're not terrible when it comes to, uh, you know, the, when it comes to it. Brian says, perhaps give a message that if this guy leaves a TV outside, he must have even more expensive stuff inside worth breaking into. Uh, yeah, I would roll on it personally. So yeah, we, we, um, I actually just have a stand out there and it's got the universal mount and you can just slide it on there. And it, and then when you're done, you just slide it off and it comes back in. It was my workout TV. So I can, take it down and put it in the workout area and it, that way I get two for one. So it works out super well. Well, Gavin, uh, great to hear you on entertainment 2.0. If you're, if you haven't listened to that podcast, Gavin's been filling in for Josh. I think out there he's been busy. I've heard you a couple times out there. Home tech.fm is a, a place your regular, uh, kind of your podcast. Yeah. Your regular weekly landing, uh, uh, and some, some good, if you love this home automation chat, you'll want to check out home tech. Dot fm uh, because that's a, just about all you guys talk about right i mean it's it, we go into mostly? news and stuff like yeah. and even though tj and seth will talk about the pro space more there's not much happening in the pro space right the, the do-it-yourself space actually has more excitement you yeah know? like probably it's, right. things move a lot faster here where in the pro space it, it takes time for it to mature yeah it didn't used to be that way there used to be nothing in the diy it was all in the pro space yeah right and now it's it's completely flipped and the prices are much cheaper in much. The D DIY than they are in the pro space. Well, Gavin, thanks for filling in, uh, for, uh, jumping in last minute. I think I, I let you know on Monday and you're like, absolutely. So yep. I appreciate you filling in over the next couple of weeks. We're going to be interviewing some, uh, I've got some companies coming in that we're going to be spending some time with, um, uh, and talking about, uh, Lucas from smart rent is coming in, talking about some, services and software and help for renters if you're if you own if you are a renter and you got some stuff he's going to come in and talk a little bit about that and then hunter and, and hung from uh, detach reset solar are coming uh, gavin we're getting to this point now when you think about solar panels what do you do when you do need to do something to your roof and those panels need to come off <laughs> right i was always told about that yeah oh yeah yeah or I think we're going to, in the next couple of years, not a couple, maybe five, we're going to get to a point where solar panels, like, I know they're supposed to last 20 years. Maybe they don't, right? Maybe that's because, listen, LED lights were supposed to last for, like, you'll never have to replace this. It'll eventually, it essentially lasts forever. That's what they told us when those things came out. You know better than, I, than that, I've right? Replaced, I've replaced <laughs> a few LED, and maybe it's not the LED light itself, but the the stuff inside it control yeah the, it, that's uh, the controller or yeah. the yeah. what do they call that thing yeah the yeah ed ed sullivan who i spend time with on sundays he had to replace two he had those little thin ones that are up in you know in the ceiling where they they're can lights but they're really only they're really an inch thick maybe even not maybe even that right and he had a couple go out and then he couldn't find 
the one like you couldn't find the right size ones they just weren't making them anymore it was a different size like it's it's kind of a messy market yes. you know? you're, yes. you're you're like oh it's not going to do i need to replace them all and they're not cheap and they just don't last as long i've got some fluorescent bulbs that have lasted longer than some of my <laughs> led lights so you're like oh, okay this is not good well anyways and then, speaking of Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan's going to join us on the on the ninth. No, yeah, on the ninth of November, he spent some time. He did an outdoor event where he was responsible for the video, uh, the video part of it, and he used a whole bunch of uh, technology, including one of those solar generators, to power the whole event for the cameras and the and the boards, the sound boards. And he actually used two jackeries to make it work. Plugged one into the other. <laughs> And they they did four, five, six hours of uh, of lighting and some of these other things to make it work. So Ed's going to come on and share some of that stuff as well. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live for the uh, Brian, Uncle Marv, uh, Tony. I saw Joe out there and I, thought I saw Ken at the very beginning of the show. Thanks for coming out uh, today and thanks for being a part of this. We'll see you back here next week. With that, we'll say goodbye.